is it? What do you make of this ongoing black cloud of threat that we have over us that Christmas could be cancelled at the last moment? Even if Christmas isn't cancelled, there could be more restrictions in the new year. Threat of you know vaccine passports, mandated jabs, none of this stuff being ruled out by the government. Where, what do you make of all of that? Well, I think it's all part of the government's campaign of fear-mongering, I'm afraid. And uh, they are trying to use fear as a tool to suppress individual liberty. And they've been pretty successful at it, actually, because uh, there are so many of our fellow citizens are cowered into submission. They're saying they're not going to go out, they're not going to engage in their normal social activities, they're not going to go and see uh, Granny, uh, and so on. So the government has been very successful in that, because obviously, if people isolate, everybody isolates, then there's going to be less um, infection spreading well, around. Of but... course, until people come out again. I mean, again, if we all go and isolate for the rest of our lives, job yeah. done. But that's not how we live our lives, is it? And that's the crucial thing. Why do you think the government wants to fear monger? Because it seems to me I'm not entirely sure the government does want to fear monger anymore. I just think it's they've now lost control of the narrative. The me many of the mainstream media, my some of these people I consider good friends, colleagues in other stations, who who just constantly just pump out all of the worst versions of the news, the worst interpretations, never any of the good news. They never look at case numbers or hospitalizations or deaths when they're going down, only when they're going up. And they seem to be sort of reveling, relishing in any bad news rather than trying to give a, a matter of fact, cold, calm look at where we are and where we need to be. Absolutely. And it has been very difficult for those of us in the House of Commons who have articulated an alternative point of view to get airtime, to get listened to. And yet we know from our emails, particularly, how many people across the country yeah. uh, agree with us and are just asking for us to be able to persuade the government uh, to apply a bit of common sense. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If, if It's terrible that people have been scared after the wits unnecessarily. The people who are sort of putting masks on their children and are terrified that, you know, like, I mean, how, how you can be so terrified of something you've not bothered done, doing the most basic research on uh, that you would know that actually your child was, a, you know, infinitesimally uh, small risk from this disease. The fact that most people who are very scared, it appears to me, don't seem to know even the most fundamental facts around who is at risk and why they're at risk and what the mitigating factors can be. Um, but it's one thing if those people are scared and they want to say, well, I'm not going to go out to a pub. I'm not going to travel. I, I, I'm not going to do anything. That's fine. OK, that's their choice. I mean, I wish that wasn't what they felt, but but it's different when they then basically insist that the government um, tells the rest of us how to live our lives as well. It, it, exactly. And the government is being very partial on all this, because I think one of the key issues around vaccine confidence is people need to be able to trust that the government is telling them the whole story. And we now know from news over the last few, few days that there, the government has to accept that there have been a significant number, albeit a very small minority, a significant number of people who have been adversely affected by the vaccine. Yes. And uh, so one way of increasing vaccine confidence would be for the government to say, um, if you are in that very unfortunate cohort who are adversely affected by the vaccines, then we'll see you, right? We'll compensate you without you having to uh, let, let go through very complicated claims procedure. That is possible under the vaccine damage payments legislation. Um, I've raised this in the House of Commons, but the government is going slow on all that. And it's almost impossible for people uh, to get any uh, give from the government when they know jolly well that they have suffered as a result yes. of well, vaccine damage. I mean, the key thing is people don't want to have that risk. Look, as you say, the risk is very, very small, but we need to address those concerns and those issues. Um, we look, we've now got at the moment, I think, a very concerted attempt to provide a scapegoat for us having to go into more restrictions, and that is the unjabbed, the dirty, the diseased, the unwashed, the unjabbed. It's all the same. The othering of those people, they are now selfish. They are the reason why the NHS would be under pressure. They would be the reason why other people's lives would be curtailed because the government would be forced to act because of those people not vaccinated. Now, as far as I can tell, there is no evidence for this whatsoever. There are lots of people, well, well actually a very small percentage of people in this country who are unjabbed, who are at a high risk in this country. Thankfully, we've, we've had very high take up. But also countries that are even higher take up, like Ireland, they are still seeing um, uh, their cases going up. Um, vaccine passports and mandated jabs has shown no impact whatsoever in terms of the course of this disease. 
Um, what do you make of this sort of othering and blame game and this scapegoating that is going on of the unjabbed? Well, I think it's a very, very dangerous uh, development because it, this is the tyranny of the majority coming into play and the, the government almost promoting it. And the, amongst those who are unvaccinated, some of them have clinical reasons why they can't be vaccinated. Um, I, I know a, a close relative of mine who's been who had the first jab and it went all went wrong. And she's been advised very strongly against having a second or, or, or third jab. And I, I know people who've decided that um, because they're expecting a baby, they're not going to get jabbed. Well, isn't that sensible for them to make their uh, own judgment? Well, on well, ago, although the evidence is now very clear, we've had a number of pregnancies during this in my family, and everyone's talked about this and researched this at great length, that the evidence is really now clear that actually of those pregnant women who are in, in COVID wards and needing serious help, nine out of 10 of those are women who've not been jabbed. And that actually you're at higher risk because of your lung capacity being affected by the baby. And therefore, actually, there is good reason for women to get the jab. But this needs to be explained in a calm and reasoned way, looking at the data to individual women rather than scapegoating. Exactly, exactly. I mean, our, our, our daughter produced a baby um, about three weeks ago. Congratulations. And she's now, she's now going out to uh, have a, a vaccine, but she decided, uh, she's, a, she's a vet by profession, so she's not ignorant about all these mm. things, but she decided that in her particular circumstances, she wouldn't get uh, the, the jab until after she produced her baby. But surely this is a matter for free choice. Yeah, I mean, that's the key thing. I mean, in terms of the Prime Minister making a decision on the 18th of December, we're told about whether or not uh, there will be restrictions at Christmas. And then the threat that if there are restrictions at Christmas, um, and people mix too freely and God forbid have fun and see their families, that in the new year will be punished with the consequences with more restrictions. Um, are there now the votes in Parliament on the, from the, you know, the COVID recovery group and others to actually stop that from happening? Or will we see that inevitably happen regardless of any vote in Parliament? Well, I think the problem in Parliament is that uh, all the people on the opposition benches are supporting the, the government. And so the people who are standing up for uh, freedom of individual and individual responsibility are the, the 30 or 40 or maybe maybe 50 of us in a good day um, who are on the back benches and are not beholden to the government because the government obviously yeah. has a lot of people on its payroll. So, do you, so we're, we, we're, we haven't we're got enough. Will will we win? I think the only way we will win is by a, a change, getting a change in public opinion, and that's where this propaganda war is being waged, and the government is waging a propaganda war, and is obsessed by going out and doing opinion polls and meeting people on the street. Well, of course, if if your propaganda is successful, then when you ask those people, they're saying, "Yes, I'm very happy to have my freedoms restricted." Yeah, and although what, what most people mean is they want other people's freedoms restricted and not their own. Uh, really good to talk to you, Sir Christopher Chope, uh, Conservative MP 